excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, let, we, we don't have much time because we're just a bit late already, but let me uh, express my feelings uh, to the organizers. I'm very thankful to the organizers and to Marina Schneider particularly for inviting me uh, to celebrate this anniversary. Uh, this gives me the opportunity of uh, carrying on this uh, uh, relationship, this liaison with UNIDRA, which dates back, I think, from the late 80s, when I had the chance, uh, together with some friends who are here in this room, like notably Marina Schneider and uh, Marc-André Reynold, to, be, to take part to the uh, committee of experts who uh, was charged of drafting the draft of the, uh, what would have been the UNIDRA Convention of 1995. And I, can, I think I can speak on behalf of my friends as well. At that time, we were certainly much younger, but we had the great chance of learning a lot, uh, being part of that committee under the guidance of some really eminent lawyers uh, like Ricardo Monaco, uh, like uh, John Harry Merriman, or uh, Pierre Lalive, uh, or Georges Droz, not to mention some of the members of that outstanding committee. Uh, but I think we also will have uh, a lot to learn today because once again let me compliment for the choice of the speakers and I can say it because I'm not one of the speakers today <laughs> I'm just the moderator uh, but, and also for the choice of the topics which are really very interesting as to this morning just to to, to mention the the, uh, the topics of this morning we really have some uh, uh, quintessential issues like uh, the problem of due diligence uh, or the problem of the uh, time limitation, which is a very important part of the uh, UNIDRA convention, or the issue of the uh, online sales, which uh, uh, were not taken into account at the time because there were no online sales at the time of the UNIDRA convention, but we will see certainly how, which is the impact of the UNIDRA convention on this topic. And also the problem of the uh, state uh, ownership of undiscovered uh, cultural objects. And last but not least, the issue of the non-retroactive uh, character of the UNIDRA convention. But uh, I will try to be a fair and equitable uh, uh, moderator. So let me remind to myself and to the speakers that they have just 15 minutes each. Uh, also because we would like to respect the extra time of 25 minutes more or less for the uh, possible questions and answers at the end of the morning. So I think that we can start with probably the youngest uh, or one among the youngest uh, uh, speakers in this conference. Uh, uh, Marie-Sophie de Clipel, uh, who is a mm, researcher uh, at University of St. Louis in Brussels. And uh, her topics, as you can see, is striking a fair balance between cultural heritage protection and private ownership through shared responsibility. Uh, Marie-Sophie is not present here, of course. She will speak in remote, remote live. So I think we can give her the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, I will share my screen. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope that the weather in Rome is better than here in Brussels. Um, just a moment. So anyway, I'm very happy to be um, virtually there with uh, all the participants. It's an honor and a pleasure. And I'm, I'm, as, as Professor Frigo said, I'm probably one of the youngest. Uh, so I hope it will help um, me to start. So what I would like to talk to you um, today is about striking a fair balance uh, that is provided within the convention between on the one hand, uh, the interest to protect cultural heritage, and in this interest to protect cultural heritage, you can find this fight against illicit trafficking of cultural goods, which is one of the objectives of the convention. But on the other hand, trying to balance this with this private ownership right, because the convention, like Professor Kono said, is a convention of uniform law, 
and has a direct impact on owners of culture objects, which is quite uh, original and unique in the field of international culture heritage law. Um, this balance between those two interests also reflects actually the double, um, the, the, the double value of a culture object. It has a culture value, it has meaning for people, but on the other hand, it also has a certain market value. And you also have all this art market, which is quite present um, when, uh, when the convention was drafted and in the minds of the drafters of the legislator when he tried to strike a fair balance. So I would like today to give a general overview of this balancing exercise in the convention, knowing that a lot of the speakers after me will go much more into depth in se uh, about certain aspects of this convention. And after that, I would like to take you at actually beyond this tension, a quite classical tension in law, where you try to mediate between competing interests, private property, individual interest, culture heritage protection, a more collective interest or a more general interest. And I would like to, to analyze if uh, these culture objects could be viewed as a common good with uh, shared responsibility. So if we start and look at the convention, it tries to draft this balancing exercise in two, uh, on, by distinguishing two regimes. On the one hand, in case of stolen cultural property, and on the other hand, in case of illegal export. In case of theft, the articles three and four um, try to give uh, th this, this, this compromise, because on the one hand, restitution is uh, mandatory by the possessor. Uh, the claim can be made by any dispossessed owner, be it a state, a public or a private person. So you see here clearly that the interest to fight against illicit trafficking and to protect culture heritage is strongly present. But on the other hand, you have it's, it's, uh, it's circumscribed. And of course, the claimant needs to prove the theft before court, which is not always easy, as some of the other speakers will show notably for archaeological heritage. And um, it's also circumscribed by a certain time limit. Um, although uh, Mr. Jakubowski will probably explain that this time limit is also contested and quite con controversial for the efficiency of the convention. But nonetheless, it's supposed to be within the three years when the claimant knew the location of the object or the identity of the possessor, and anyway, maximum 50 years or even longer. And that's why it's interesting uh, to, to see that the balancing exercise operates again here between protecting private ownership, providing some legal certainty to the longtime owner, but on the other hand, still trying to fight against this illicit trafficking. And finally, uh, one of the other ways to, to try to strike a fair balance is that although restitution by the possessor is automatic in case of theft, there is a possibility for the possessor to be fairly and reasonably com compensated, but he needs to prove due diligence. And this is a notion that Professor Renault will probably um, will dive much further into. And this sets also a quite higher standard for the owners and the possessors of culture heritage. And this reasonable compensation is yet uh, no total reimbursement of the object on the international market price. It's more the idea of a compensation. And if you look now uh, at the balancing exercise, not of stolen culture property, but illicit exports, it's the articles five, six, and seven of the convention. There you see that the exercise is a bit different um, because it's deemed a little bit less uh, important as an infringement than stolen culture property. Uh, here, there is no talk about restitution, but return by the possessor. Um, so you see again clearly that there is an advantage here for, to protect culture heritage, but it should be requested by a contracting state, so not any dispossessed owner before a court or authority, and the request should establish that it is illegally exported or that its removal impairs culture heritage or that it was temporarily exported but not returned afterwards. Again, you have this time limit that operates. Uh, the three years relative time limit and anyway maximum 50 years since the date of the export which limits of course some claims especially for uh, colonial heritage like you which is much talked upon uh, at the moment and here also you have this idea that besides um, the return that's, that, that, the, that, the, that the possessor should return the object 
he can be fairly and reasonably compensated as long as he proves that he acquired it with due diligence. And the standard of due diligence is a bit lower, a bit less than for theft, um, as Professor Renaud will probably show, but nonetheless, it had an impact on the art market as being uh, clearly used as a benchmark. And here, uh, in case of illicit exports, the return is not automatic as for theft. The possessor may choose to either uh, give it back, return it, or retain ownership or transfer ownership to a person residing in the requesting state, provided that, that the requesting state agrees. And here you see also that the return is not, uh, there is no return when the object was created during the, was exported, sorry, during the lifetime of the creator or 50 years after his death. Finally, one other big balancing exercise you can see is that the convention, of course, is not retroactive. Uh, this is typically something in law that you can see when applying law in time, that you apply it for new facts and not for facts that happened before its entry to force. And this is something that um, Vincent Negri will uh, much more explain later on. So this balancing test shows that compromises were made when drafting the convention in order to remain as, as fairly as possible and realistic, but still um, few ratifications are made by the so-called market states. Uh, Professor Kono clearly showed the evolution, um, but you see that a lot of the market states are still missing, probably due notably due to misconceptions about what automatic restitution exactly would mean, and this notion of due diligence that's perceived as a threat to the bona fide possessor who needs now to prove he acquired it with due diligence. And yet, nonetheless, the Unidra Convention, its influence, even though it's not ratified by a lot of countries, is undeniable. If I look at my own country in Belgium, we had a study conducted in 2012 to examine whether we would ratify it or not, and there the conclusion was that it was not quite clear, and the politicians rather decided that ratification was not necessary, also because of this threat to the bona fide possessor. But a few years later, in 2018, the Senate drafted a report where actually it was recommended to examine the ratification of the UNIDRA Convention, as it was seen as a quite effective tool to fight against illicit trafficking. So you can see that mentalities are shifting. Um, we ratified the 1970 convention. So this also shows that it can go together with this uh, shifting mentalities and openness. And here I also added you a picture of a restitution very recently taking place in Belgium. Restitutions are taking place almost on a daily basis worldwide and here uh, we restituted a mask to Guatemala after a case of uh, illegal export. Now, after having analyzed quite uh, literally this convention and the, the kind of balance it aims to strike, it would be interesting to go beyond this and to wonder, could we look at the cultural object as a common good? And the theory of the commons, which was notably uh, developed by Elinor Ostrom, uh, has a lot of definitions, but you could say that it's the idea to have several rights and several interests that coexist on one object. And then you would move from this kind of exclusive model where you have culture heritage against ownership, private ownership right, to a more inclusive model of what I called in my research, cultural property of shared interest. Now, I totally don't have time to dive into this, but I will give you an example uh, to show what I, uh, I'd like to mean with this idea of shared interest, is that you would have on one object, I provided here the example of a statue from Congo in Kissing Conde, where you would have a cultural property right by the owner, so it's not an absolute ownership right, but it's limited by the idea of cultural heritage protection. Here it would be the Belgian state, for instance. But you would have next to this cultural property right, also a human right, a fundamental right to culture heritage, a right to access, to use, to enjoyment. And this would be shared amongst uh, what I called collective actors, stakeholders. And you could see that it could go to a community, heritage community, citizens, users. In this case, it could mean that the tribe in, in, in Boma would be involved, the African diaspora in Belgium or beyond, museum visitors, art market, etc. And besides these, these rights, 
uh, on, on the object, there would also be interest to act in favor of the object. And this cultural interest would be um, in the hands of the public authority, who would act then as a guardian to protect it, but also, and that's where it's interesting, also these collective actors, which I just cited, who would also uh, function as guardians to protect this culture heritage. Of course, uh, all these stakeholders, and especially these collective actors that I would like, to, where it's important to shed more light on them, there would be conflicts among these several actors. And here, all the idea of balancing and proportionality is again, very important. Now, this idea of sharing rights and interests also, on the other hand, means that there's a sharing responsibility for the protection of culture heritage. If you share rights, you also share responsibility. And this is where um, the, the idea of shared responsibility that you find much more, uh, more and more in international frameworks and declarations toward culture heritage is also quite interesting. I, um, in my research, I, I tried to, to see four forms of responsibility. The two first ones are the quite classical ones directed towards the past, where you're liable for something that committed in the past, where the owner breaks the object, for instance, he's liable. Uh, there's also this idea of risk liability. But where it's interesting, it's to see two other forms that are directed towards the future, where you find this idea of duty of care, which is very much present in culture heritage protection, and that would be shared among owner, public authority, but also these collective actors, they would act to care for culture heritage. And finally, this emerging idea of participative responsibility, it goes together with all this governance um, uh, where uh, other stakeholders participate in determining, interpreting, defining what culture heritage uh, might mean uh, to them. And so this, this, this shift where you, where you get to see a more inclusive idea of a cultural property of shared interest and a shared responsibility toward heritage is not really a radical change. It's rather setting a new light, having a new perspective on some, of, of some kind of re legal reality, taking into consideration this human rights-based approach where you, that you can see a lot moving on with this right to access to culture heritage and culture goods and this shifting mentalities. And it can be quite useful, I think, in the restitution and the ongoing uh, decolonization uh, debates. And um, taking into consideration, that will be my final slide, that it's all a matter of, of balance. Here you have this rope dancer that tries to balance between all these rights and interests to provide uh, the, the best way to protect culture heritage. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Marie-Sophie, for your intervention. And we wait for you to stay in touch with us because we will maybe need your presence for the question and answers. Yes. Uh, uh, let's now switch to French. La, la prochaine présentation, c'est par uh, Marc-André Reynold, qui n'a aucune nécessité d'être présenté ici, mais en tout cas, uh, il est professeur de uh, droit de l'art et de biens culturels uh, et titulaire de la chaire UNESCO en droit international de la protection de biens culturels à l'Université de Genève. Et il est aussi le directeur du bien connu Centre du droit de l'art. Et donc, le sujet et la question de la centrale de la diligence requise. Marc-André, tu as la parole. Merci, Manuel. La Convention du Nid droit aborde de front la question de la diligence requise, de la due diligence. On en a déjà plusieurs fois entendu parler ce matin lors de l'acquisition d'un bien culturel. Et c'est l'une parmi ses nombreuses qualités. J'ai l'intention de regarder avec vous cette notion d'un peu plus près, non sans d'abord remercier toute l'équipe du Nid droit et tout particulièrement Marina Schneider de l'organisation de cette belle conférence anniversaire. Je commencerai par quelques rappels. Je pourrais être bref grâce à, à l'excellent exposé de Marie-Sophie de Clipele, une ancienne étudiante qui me fait bien plaisir d'entendre. Avant... Euh, d'analyser de manière plus précise le concept de diligence requise tel que prévu par la Convention et de voir ensuite ce qu'il en est de la pratique judiciaire pour terminer par 
le cas un peu plus compliqué des transactions successives. Alors, quelques rappels tout d'abord s'imposent. La Convention a opté, dans l'hypothèse d'un bien culturel volé, pour un système qui privilégie le propriétaire d'origine. On dira aussi le propriétaire des possédés, qu'il s'agisse d'un particulier ou d'un État. On connaît l'importance de la propriété de l'État sur les biens archéologiques situés dans son sous-sol ou dans ses eaux intérieures ou territoriales et qui font malheureusement souvent, on le sait, on l'a entendu déjà ce matin, l'objet de fouilles et autres pillages. Le concept d'acquisition de bonne foi de la propriété d'un bien culturel volé ou licitement exporté est donc étranger à la Convention du Nid droit et ses concepteurs et conceptrices ont donc opté pour un système qui s'approche plus de la common law que de celle des États de tradition civiliste. Cela a pu peut-être constituer, selon certains, un frein à la ratification de la Convention par les États civilistes, mais il suffit de regarder la liste des quelques 48 États qui l'ont ratifié à ce jour pour se rendre compte, Italie en tête, que ceux-ci sont quand même assez nombreux et qu'une objection de cette nature tient plus du prétexte politique que d'une objection juridiquement fondée. Donc gardons-nous bien des procès d'intention mal fondés que d'ailleurs l'un des founding fathers de cette convention, le professeur Pierre Lalive, que je ne peux pas évidemment ne pas citer aujourd'hui, mon regretté maître à l'Université de Genève, a été l'un des premiers à dénoncer avec le sens d'humour au vitriol qui pouvait le caractériser et dont certains, certains ici se souviendront certainement. Manlio, tu as fait référence à son nom tout à l'heure. C'est ainsi donc que l'une des normes principales de la Convention, dans une disposition qui est d'une clarté remarquable, pour une convention de droit uniforme, cette disposition prévoit que le possesseur d'un bien culturel, je cite, « volé » doit le restituer. C'est l'article 3 de la convention, alinéa 1. On ne peut guère imaginer de normes synthétiques, plus synthétiques, plus englobantes, ce qu'ont révélé d'ailleurs de nombreux commentaires. Est-ce donc à dire que la diligence de l'acquéreur est sans effet. Non, bien sûr, d'abord parce que je ne serai pas là pour vous parler du thème de la diligence requise, mais aussi parce que, selon le, la Convention, il peut prétendre à une indemnité équitable pour autant qu'il puisse prouver avoir agi avec la diligence requise lors de son acquisition. Je n'aborderai pas la question ici de ce que l'on peut entendre par une indemnité équitable ou le fardeau de la preuve, on a mentionné le fait qu'il est renversé, du moins pour les biens volés. Euh, mais ce qui m'intéresse évidemment ici, c'est la définition très pragmatique qui a été retenue par la Convention de ce qu'est cette diligence requise. C'est ainsi que l'article 4, alinéa 4, dessine les contours de cette notion en précisant dans une liste exemplative les circonstances qui sont à prendre en considération pour que soit retenue la diligence de l'acquéreur d'un bien qui se révèle avoir été volé. Et l'article 6, alinéa 2, <coughs> donne encore les circonstances à retenir qui sont propres aux biens illicitement exportés. Je vais citer pour mémoire ces textes. Pour déterminer si le possesseur a agi avec la diligence requise, il sera tenu compte de toutes les circonstances de l'acquisition, notamment de la qualité des parties, du prix payé, de la consultation par le possesseur de tout registre, etc., de la documentation requise qu'il aurait pu raisonnablement obtenir et de la consultation d'organismes auxquels il pourrait avoir accès. Et encore de toute autre démarche qu'une personne raisonnable aurait entreprise dans les mêmes circonstances. Disposition qui précise donc ce qu'est le devoir de diligence. L'article 6, alinéa 2, de son côté, précise encore que pour le, euh, les biens culturels illicitement exportés, euh, on va, et je cite, « pour déterminer si le possesseur a su aurait dû raisonnablement savoir que le bien culturel avait été illicitement exporté, il sera tenu compte des circonstances de l'acquisition, notamment du défaut de certificat 
d'exportation. L'importance de trouver une définition uniforme du concept de diligence requise n'a pas échappé aux rédacteurs de la Convention. Il n'en demeure pas moins qu'ils ont retenu une notion souple qui peut, voire doit évoluer en fonction des exigences du commerce international, de l'art et des biens culturels et de la lutte contre le trafic. Commençons par voir un peu de plus près les éléments retenus par la Convention. Alors, il y a la qualité des parties. On va regarder si c'est un commerçant ou un particulier, un collectionneur ou un musée ou un laïc, si j'ose dire. On va penser peut-être aujourd'hui à l'opposition vente aux enchères, vente aux enchères sur Internet, euh, évidemment pas mentionnée dans la, dans la convention, ou vente euh, en privé. Le prix payé, second élément. S'il est trop bas, un indice d'illicité. S'il est trop, peut-être un indice de tromperie. La consultation des registres. Alors, on a, M. Catesi a cité tout à l'heure, évidemment, la base de données d'Interpol. Il y a celle des carabiniers italiens, de l'OCBC et d'autres. Et bien sûr aussi des registres privés. On nous parle aussi de toute autre information et documentation pertinente. Ça, c'est une, on pourrait dire, une catch-all provision qui permet de mettre beaucoup de choses dans la, dans, sous une euh, dénomination générale. On continue avec la consultation d'organismes. Alors, on pourra citer l'UNESCO, l'ICOM, les bureaux spécialisés auprès des ministères nationaux. Euh, ici, je ne résiste pas à une petite anecdote, à vous raconter une petite anecdote judiciaire. C'est la célèbre affaire Goldberg que nous connaissons tous, ou beaucoup d'entre nous ici. Lorsque l'acheteuse de la mosaïque volée à Chypre, ou des mosaïques volées à Chypre, nous a dit, a dit au tribunal qu'elle s'était informée auprès du siège principal de l'UNESCO à Genève. Évidemment, ça a été un, un élément mauvais pour elle, dans la mesure où, bien sûr, il y a à Genève, certes, un bureau de l'UNESCO, mais ce bureau de l'UNESCO n'a absolument rien à voir avec le problématique de la protection des biens culturels. On sait bien que le siège de l'UNESCO, M. Ramirez n'est pas là pour nous le dire, mais est à Paris. Élément donc retenu à l'encontre de la bonne foi de Madame, de la diligence de Madame Goldberg, c'était clair. Euh, et puis alors, je finirai bien sûr en faisant allusion dans toute cette liste à euh, l'existence euh, ou au défaut du certificat d'exportation mentionné à l'article 6 alinéa 2. Euh, là aussi, il est intéressant de voir qu'on a retenu dans la convention ce, cet élément pour ce qui est de l'exportation illicite, bien sûr, mais je suis pour ma part convaincu que ce n'est pas seulement un indice de l'absence de diligence requise dans l'hypothèse de l'exportation illicite, mais aussi dans le cas du vol. Mais je ne suis pas toujours suivi, notamment pas par le tribunal fédéral suisse. Alors, qu'en est-il de la pratique jurisprudentielle Plusieurs exemples tirés de la pratique judiciaire démontrent que les juges sont de plus en plus exigeants envers les acquéreurs lorsqu'il s'agit de déterminer s'ils ont agi avec la diligence requise. Ils, certes pas tous, ils ne sont certes pas tous des cas d'application de la Convention du Nid droit elle-même, car ils émanent parfois de juridictions qui n'ont pas encore ratifié la Convention, ils n'en sont pas moins illustratifs, à mon avis, de ce qu'est cette notion de devoir de diligence et à son interprétation. Je citerai ici deux exemples tirés de jurisprudence nationale. Tout d'abord, l'existence d'une rumeur concernant le vol d'un tableau du peintre dont une œuvre était l'objet de la transaction litigieuse a été jugée suffisante pour exiger un devoir élevé de diligence de la part de l'acquéreur. Il s'agit de l'affaire du tableau de Malevich, le laquais au Samovar, décidé par le tribunal fédéral suisse 
en avril 2013. Le tribunal fédéral a considéré sur la base que, sur la base de cette rumeur relative à une œuvre volée, que l'acquéreur d'une autre œuvre euh, se devait de faire preuve d'un très haut degré de diligence, et ce qui n'a pas été retenu en l'espèce. Une autre circonstance, et ce sera mon second exemple, euh, intéressante, reconnue par la pratique, concerne le dos d'un tableau de Pissarro, rue Saint-Honoré, après-midi, effet de pluie, sur lequel, dos du tableau, donc, figurait une étiquette en partie arrachée. Cette circonstance a amené un juge nord-américain du district de Californie, du Central District de Californie, le 30 avril 2019, a exigé de l'acquéreur qu'il fasse preuve d'une très grande vigilance lors de son acquisition, ce qui ici non plus n'avait pas été le cas. Vous voyez donc dans ces deux exemples que d'une part la jurisprudence élève le fardeau, suit donc quelque part la tendance générée par la Convention du droit, même si on ne l'applique pas directement, puisqu'il s'agissait d'un côté des États-Unis et de l'autre côté de la Suisse qui n'ont pas ratifié, et pourtant, et pourtant le, le fardeau est toujours plus élevé. Enfin, et ce sera ma dernière remarque avant de conclure, quelle est la réponse que l'on peut donner à la délicate question des multiples transactions en chaîne ou successives il n'avait pas échappé aux rédacteurs de la Convention du Nid droit que les biens culturels peuvent faire l'objet de multiples transactions successives, parfois très rapidement, parfois sur une longue durée. D'ailleurs, dans les deux cas que je viens de mentionner, de jurisprudentiel, un problème difficile était précisément le fait qu'entre le moment du vol ou de l'exportation illicite et l'acquisition finale, Plusieurs, voire un grand nombre de transactions étaient survenues. À ces articles 4 alinéa 5 et 6 alinéa 5, la Convention du droit nous indique que, je cite, « le possesseur ne peut bénéficier d'un statut plus favorable que celui de la personne dont il a acquis le bien culturel par héritage ou autrement à titre gratuit. » Cette disposition qui permet d'éviter le blanchiment d'un bien mal acquis par le biais d'une donation ou d'une succession ultérieure, ne mentionne malheureusement pas une autre hypothèse, l'hypothèse peut-être principale que l'on trouve dans le marché de l'art, à savoir la transaction ultérieure à titre onéreux. Une vente privée, une vente aux enchères, etc. Alors, si je peux, avec beaucoup de retenu, me permettre une toute petite critique de, du texte de la Convention en ce moment de célébration. Mais comme dit l'adage qui aime bien, châtie bien, je dirais que cette hypothèse n'a peut-être pas suffisamment été explorée par les rédacteurs de l'époque. Ce qui, je dois le dire, reste à prouver à teneur des travaux préparatoires. Quoi qu'il en soit, et fort heureusement, ce problème peut être résolu par l'application d'une autre disposition de la Convention, à savoir son article 9, alinéa premier, qui permet aux États contractants, je cite, d'appliquer toute règle plus favorable à la restitution ou au retour de biens culturels. Par conséquent, même si vous avez une hypothèse dans une transaction successive où on aura peut-être de la peine à ce que la restitution ou le retour soit prononcé, euh, sur la base des, de ces acquisitions successives, on pourra quand même le faire sur la base de cette disposition. En conclusion, la Convention du Nid droit de 1995 fait aujourd'hui à plus d'un titre partie du cadre juridique général et conceptuel selon lequel le comportement des parties à une transaction portant sur un bien culturel sera évalué. Dans ce sens, on peut clairement indiquer que les dispositions de la Convention du Nid droit sur la diligence requise sont ce devenues ce qu'on peut considérer comme le benchmark de ce qu'est la diligence. Ce benchmark à l'aune duquel une transaction sera examinée. Qui plus est, la précision du texte, à mon avis inégalée, 
servira, j'en suis certain, à l'application et à l'interprétation d'autres textes internationaux, par exemple la récente Convention du Conseil de l'Europe sur les infractions visant les biens culturels, la Convention de Nicosie de 2017, qui fait référence dans plusieurs de ses dispositions à la notion de diligence requise. Je n'en dis pas plus parce que je sais que Jérôme Fromageau en parlera davantage cet après-midi. Quoi qu'il en soit, j'aimerais relever le très beau succès qu'est la Convention du Nid droit et notamment ses dispositions sur la diligence requise, succès tellement grand qu'il est repris non seulement par des, juri des, des, des juridictions nationales, mais aussi par d'autres textes internationaux. Et je dois dire qu'on euh, peut, en ce jour d'anniversaire, ne faire qu'être heureux de cette situation. Je vous remercie. Merci, merci Marc-André pour cette euh, très intéressante euh, présentation sur, et, et pour avoir donné, posé le, la question et donné la réponse déjà avec l'article 9. Sur, <rire> yes. uh, Well, now we, 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 we go on with uh, somebody who's far away from here, Anna Filipa Vdoliak. Uh, as you know, she's a professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Technology of Sydney and also UNESCO Chair of International Law and Cultural Heritage. And uh, she's also president of the International Cultural Property Society. Uh, the, topic is, as you will see, the regulation of online sales. I hope Anna is with us. And Anna, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Frigo. Distinguished guests, colleagues, and um, Madam Schneider and your team at UNIDWA, thank you for this kind invitation and making this anniversary event possible. When Marina approached me about taking part in this event, I proposed the subject of the internet and new technologies which were already making a clear and significant impact on our lives, both positive and negative. However, it was not obvious then how rapid and profound that impact would be in the light of the restrictions arising from the pandemic. The internet and new technologies have had significant effects on the regulation of the trade in um, cultural objects and the art antiquities market. The UNIDWA Convention was adopted at a time when the uptake of the internet was just commencing. It is estimated that 10% of the world's population was using the internet. Today, it is 60%, although that usage is not evenly distributed. My intervention will provide a brief overview of the implications of these new technologies for the regulation of the market and the implications for the role of law, much of it forecast by the UNIDWA Convention. I will track the, chain, the changing technological landscape in the intervening quarter century since the adoption of the convention and outline how this has impacted on the regulation through international cooperation between states and intergovernmental organisations in law enforcement and the role of non-state actors and particularly due diligence. For if one thing is clear as a result of these changes, the role of non-state actors, including corporations and individuals, must be addressed in this field. Let me begin with a brief overview of the changes wrought by the internet in this field. The 1995 Munidwa Convention understandably did not mention the internet. Nevertheless, the preamble and substantive provisions provide a measure of guidance of regulation and redress in these rapidly changing times. The preamble itself says that it cannot provide all the solutions to the problems raised by the illicit trade, but that it, there is a need to initiate a process which will enhance international cooperation. Through its emphasis on uniformity of national laws in this field and recognising the role of non-state actors, it provides an important way forward at this time. Like early periods of globalisation and rapid technological change, the internet has inter intensified our interconnectedness. Since 1995, each wave of new technologies has diminished the pervasiveness of the state and its capacity to effectively regulate and oversee the behaviour of those within its jurisdictions. This phenomenon and its impact on the market in cultural objects is mapped across the three phases that have been unfurled in the intervening period. The first 
decade from 1995 to 2005 is defined by the rise in internet usage, e-commerce platforms and the emphasis on the regulation of the market. The second decade from 2005 to 2015 is defined by the rise of social media and related peer-to-peer -peer platforms and the emphasis on law enforcement, while the current decade from 2015 onwards has brought further, further down the road of block, through blockchain and um, in my, uh, commerce devices or platforms and the dark web. So the first decade saw the introduction of e-commerce sites at the same, in the same year that the UNIDUA convention was adopted, including P P the first person-to-person -person online auction site, which became eBay, and Amazon.com, which has become the, the world's largest e-commerce site with a market capitalization of in excess of $1 trillion this year. It was forecast that these platforms would globalize, diversify, and expand the market. These generalist e-commerce sites remain important platform for the trade in cultural goods, including antiquities. However, assessments of the nature of the cultural objects offered on these sites have consistently found the cultural objects offered for sale occupy the lower end of the market, are modest in size in relation to the volume of looting that has occurred, and that a significant proportion of them are fakes. Unlike other commercial sectors, this sector has been very stubborn in its embrace of digital, the digital realm. The most successful have been the established auction houses, aggregator sites, and those innovative which are providing online access as well as exclusive viewings. Specialist e-commerce sites have occupied the mid-range market while live auctions by established auction houses continue to dominate the high-end market. Insiders and researchers have identified a number of challenges, including authenticity and fakes, assessment of conditions, fulfillment of orders, transparency, and the overexposure. Some of these issues have been addressed through the terms of service. Researchers also noted that they provide a greater understanding of the, of the illicit trade in cultural objects, especially the end stage of the cycle. Thus, perhaps unsurprisingly, the first decade remained largely focused on the regulation of the behavior of actors in the illicit trade, particularly the basic actions to counter increasing sales of objects through the internet of 2006, which emphasized the role of the illicit market and the positive potential of the internet in curbing the illicit trade in cultural objects. Non-state actors were called on to access information that was becoming readily available and updated through digital platforms, including inventories of stolen objects provided by Interpol and ICOM that has been mentioned, and databases and national laws, such as that provided by UNESCO. The basic action also called on states to encourage these platforms to post disclaimers, asking buyers to verify provenance, that is compliance with export controls, and request evidence of title. Several of these countries have also entered into agreements with eBay to this effect. Despite the significant resources of these platforms, oversight is usually left to national museums and law enforcement. The second decade of operation of the UNIDUA Convention coincided with the launch and rapid uptake of social networking on the internet. Facebook was launched in 2004 and also now has a market capitalization of just under a trillion dollars with nearly a third of the world's population um, as active users on this world's largest social media network. Well, WhatsApp, which is, um, uh, was acquired by Facebook, a mobile encrypted messaging service, which was launched in 2009, has 2 billion users. While these platforms are used by actors across the trading cycle of cultural objects, unlike e-platforms, they have provided an important window into understanding the operations of those at the beginning of the trading cycle, particularly the, those engaged in illicit traffic and excavations. Recent studies of the illicit trade in antiquities from the Middle East and North Africa have found that these technologies through their design and nature fuel such activity. Indeed, although they occupy a gray zone, they are relatively unscrutinized by law enforcement and therefore much of their activities occur publicly and are publicly accessible via the internet. Indeed, it is found that Facebook in many ways has normalized these activities, unfortunately. This 
uh, period also coincides with a growing public awareness and appreciation of the illicit marketing and cultural objects, especially antiquities from conflict zones used by financial uh, to finance terrorist organizations and transnational criminal organizations with specific references to internet sales in General Assembly and Security Council resolutions. There was a call to, uh, to cooperate with the law enforcement investigations to address this illicit trade. Unfortunately, these platforms have been slow to act despite growing evidence. A whistleblower petition to the US um, Securities Exchange Commission in 2009 made it clear of Facebook's failure to address this trade um, in relation to postings which financed known terrorist groups. Indeed, Facebook only changed its community standards this year in June to address the trade and monitoring is done haphazardly. The next decade or our current decade since the adoption of the Unidwar Convention has seen the rise of e-commerce of e commerce or mobile commerce and blockchain, which appears to have untethered the market in cultural objects even further from effective regulation of states and intergovernmental organizations. The complexity of Facebook's impact and that of other social media in, uh, platforms on the regulation and law enforcement efforts to prevent financing of criminal and terrorist activities is made more complex by the plan platform's incorporation of encrypted peer-to-peer -peer communication applications and cryptocurrencies using blockchain. Early usage by the art market of blockchain has been short-lived and patchy. It is focused on a system of provenance research using a decentralized register, cryptocurrencies and data sales. A recent survey of the art market has found there has been a growing acceptance of cryptocurrencies as a payment method with at least a quarter of our online art platforms using it or intending to use it and at least 4% already using it. A study of Facebook's um, invention in the field has found that the incorporation of cryptocurrencies will be further utilized by traffickers. By contrast, a recent um, analysis by the Rand Corporation found that the dark web and related technologies, including cryptocurrencies, occupy only a minor segment of the market in cultural objects. Given the nascent nature of the intervention of these, uh, of these technologies into the market, it's not surprising that there is no explicit reference to them in relevant documents. However, it is important to, that the very mix of receptions of um, blockchain technologies, especially cryptocurrencies by states. They have been a potentially disruptive impact on national currencies and in turn the capacity to regulate the financial sector. So it is somewhat ironic that Facebook itself is reluctant to engage in the floating of cryptocurrencies and will generally tie it to a national currency and that is their intention. On that note, let me turn to two facets of regulatory efforts arising from this period. The first is regulation and international cooperation in criminal justice. There has been a significant shift over this period of the last quarter century in the focus from market regulation, the first decade, to increasing focus on criminal justice and law enforcement to combat the illicit trade in cultural objects to complement and reinforce the role of UNIDWAR and its aim to promote uniform law in respect of restitution or return of cultural objects. Indeed, the convention in its preamble references this important aspect about other effective measures, including registers and technical cooperation. As with everything with the internet, there is a clear understanding during this period that the internet has both fueled um, the illicit trade in cultural objects, particularly around the financing of terrorist organisations, but also transnational criminal organisations. But on the other side, there is also the recognition of the positive potential of these new technologies to ensure the addressing of these challenges. And so what we have in Security Council resolutions, which were adopted from this period from 1990 through to 2017 with its first standalone Security Council resolution on cultural heritage is the recognition to address sales auctions through the internet. 
the basic action of 2006, which was in response, developed in response to this by Interpol, ICOM and UNESCO, recognises the legal position of the challenges arising from the legal position of these corporations, entities and individuals that trade on the internet. And also that quite often where the objects are sold is different from where the internet platform is located. They call on not only the uh, uh, member states to request disclaimers, but also request that these internet platforms um, assist in law enforcement efforts. Unfortunately, none of these initiatives directly address the non-state actors themselves, that is, the internet providers and these platforms. This is problematic given the need and the, the significant impact of these platforms on this trade, as I've mentioned. Indeed, as one of the researchers looking at this of the intervention of Facebook in particular has noted is the important evidentiary um, necessity of Facebook retaining its digital archive in order, in order to provide evidence in any claims later on in relation to restitution claims or, restri or enforcement proceedings. Let me now move on very briefly to the codes of ethics and regulation and due diligence. These developments in international regulation of the trade of cultural objects increasingly propelled interventions addressing non-state actors, including articulation and enforcement of standards of conduct in relation to professionals in the art market and museums. And indeed, the Unidwa Convention references this in its preamble and is reinforced by the due diligence requirement. Since 1995, UNESCO has adopted, as we know, the International Code of Ethics for Dealers in 1999, the ICON Code, which has already been referenced, and the International Guidelines for Criminal Prevention and Criminal Justice Responses has called on states to develop in collaboration with internet providers and web-based auctioneers a specific code of conduct for them. Significantly, the Nicosia Convention makes reference to violations by professionals and public officials in this field as being an aggravating factor in any enforcement proceedings. Unfortunately, most of these obligations are soft law and generally are addressed to states rather than these third or non-state actors. And most of it is dependent on self-regulation, -regul which as we know, in and of itself is deeply problematic. Noting the time, I will, I will conclude by making a few um, observations in relation to the impact of these new technologies since the adoption of the 1995 Unidwa Convention. First, it has enabled greater transparency of the market, which has been generally cloaked in secrecy. There is growing public awareness of the, of the public nature of the trade at all parts of the life cycle has led to a fuller and more nuanced understanding of the market, which can only add in the formulation and implementation of more effective regulatory measures. Second, with greater access to information concerning inventories of stolen cultural objects and data of national and regional and legal actions has led to greater emphasis on the need for verification of compliance and authentication. And that has been borne out in successive UN um, Security Council resolutions and indeed through international laws. And thirdly and finally, as with other sectors, these new technologies have a disruptive effect which have negative and positive aspects. If the last 25 years has shown anything, is that these changes and disruptions will no doubt continue, even though the drafters of the UNIDOA Convention could not have foreseen such significant changes, the Convention in its preamble and its substantive provisions is able to provide us with a way forward. And thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you, Anna, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, I will, I will not comment your, your presentation because just because we don't have time was very interesting, uh, particularly your last reference to the transparency or better the lack of transparency of the art market, <laughs> which is a very important issue. But as we are a bit late, uh, I would suggest that we now have, uh, we will have a pause, but I would suggest to 
uh, operate a kind of a self-restraint. So instead of 20 minutes, I would ask uh, for 15 minutes of, uh, of pause and then we will get back again. Okay, shall we start again? Welcome <laughs> once again. Uh, we now have another of, of our many friends here, uh, Andrei Yakubovsky, who is assistant professor at the Institute of Law Studies of the University of Opole. And he is also the chair of the International Law uh, Association Committee on Participation in Global Cultural Heritage Governance. And his topic is very, very intriguing. Uh, the making the resolution of cultural heritage disputes more effective, time limitations under the UNITRA uh, convention. Andre, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for, uh, for this introduction and it's my great honor uh, to take part in this historic event, um, the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the UNITRA convention. In my talk, while addressing the general um, construction uh, of time limitations um, uh, for bringing claims under this treaty. I will especially focus on, uh, on sacred and commonly important cultural objects belonging and used by tribal and indigenous communities. Uh, this paper, this, this short presentation, will, um, uh, will thus conclude with demonstrating the significance of UNIDWA conventional regime for the, for the current debate and current processes of repairing cultural wrongs suffered by such communities. Professor Patrick O'Keefe, the author of the UNESCO report which led to the, uh, to the UNIDRA Convention and the, uh, the Foundation Chairman of International Law Association Committee on Cultural Heritage Law, once referred to time limitation under UNIDRA Convention as the greatest, greatest barrier to adoption of this treaty. And surprisingly, the issue was also subject to most difficult and harsh negotiations on the convention. The final com um, compromise formula was eventually reached at the last minute stage of the diplomatic conference. However, before I move to, to may I ask for the, um, uh, I move to the uh, actual provision of the convention, there are two key questions that need to be, need to be asked. First, why should special qualified limitation periods uh, apply to international claims for recovery of cultural objects? Uh, obviously, cultural objects are not ordinary goods. And since the famous theft of uh, Mona Lisa, this, this stealing, misappropriation, and illicit transfer uh, can neither be seen as ordinary crimes. Yet the issue of limitation periods, that is the time uh, within which a legal action for recovery of cultural objects must be commenced had always been problematic. The 1970 UNESCO Convention does not deal with the issue and, and this area is covered often by the matrix of competing rules of domestic law. And this is, this is, this is also what was today um, explained by Professor Kono. Uh, the, uh, the, Practice also shows that the location and identity of, of illicitly removed cultural objects are revealed after many years. And the actual determination whether a given claim is time barred uh, might be difficult and, cost, and costly. And this is this also, I think, that the issue of the, of, uh, of the cost of litigation and the cost of bringing claims was today also, also approached in, in different occasions. Uh, the second question is what is the purpose of um, uh, the, special, uh, the special qualified limit limitation periods if the convention itself is not retroactive and therefore why should states ratify? And this is, a, uh, this is the question um, that obviously the convention itself is not retroactive, uh, but the, some states may see convention as a only additional instrument with not added value for the, in, uh, for the interest to recover heritage less in the past, especially with when this past aspect, the um, restitution of the, of the lost, uh, of the lost um, um, cultural treasures is, the, is dominating in their heritage policy. Um, however, I, th I think uh, today it was really, really stressed uh, 
also in the last presentation by Professor Doyak, that UNRWA, that UNRWA Convention is, is crucial for the present, is crucial for the present challenges, is the crucial for the present challenges also related to uh, the development of technology. And so, so, so this aspect, this, this, this looking for some states, looking always back, should be, should be, should be overcome by this, uh, by this perspective, going to the future, the new, the new, uh, the new challenges of, of, um, of art market. And so, so this, so these time limitations under the UIVA Convention are designed to making the resolution of cultural heritage discourse easier and are more affecting by eliminating often lengthy legal analysis and frustrating state of legal limbo, which sometimes happens. Um, and also uniform prescription periods relating to given categories object, of objects may make settlements of dispute more efficient, though not all problems can be eliminated. And so I will start now from the, uh, briefly to the, um, to the, from the provisions and not from the provisions on stolen uh, cultural objects, but do, those on illi uh, illegally exported. So the, so, the so the rule is as follows. Any request for return, for return should be brought within a period of three years <laughs> from the time when the requesting states knew the location of the cultural object and, uh, and identity of its possessor, and in any case within a period of 50 years from the date of the, of the export, etc. So, uh, so, uh, so here, obviously, obviously uh, the question is these three years which is the, uh, also, also, uh, also was addressed today by Mariso Ferdikli uh, on the beginning that th this can create um, um, important difficulties. And I'm showing just briefly this, this, this painting, this, pa this famous, famous case, uh, famous case um, of uh, illicit um, exportation from Italy to United, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, the, question, the question here, here, here is that, that the, the object has been in a legal limbo for some time because, or maybe I think it still is. The question was was um, was that uh, um, the Italy could not uh, could not present could not present um, the claim for for return based on the uh, EU regul uh, EU directive because of the of the of the time limitation. Instead, 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 uh, um, authorities United Kingdom. Could, uh, did, did not consider them, uh, themselves um, competent to, to grant to grant uh, to grant uh, export pay, permit outside the United Kingdom. So the object was was could be only con, uh, only stay in the uh, United Kingdom. So 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 was not uh, so this was this is the, and this was very difficult for 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 the complex situation to 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 present to present the claim in a, in a, in a given time of three years and also when you think about this 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 article uh, article 5 on uh, on um, here there are some exceptions exceptions and uh, exceptions from exceptions so so this is the situation situation of um, of um, uh, cultural um, of cultural objects that that have been uh, create, uh, cre uh, created by the living by the living author, and, and the, exception, the exception is uh, that when this object is created by, uh, by, by a member of a community of indigenous or tribal community, uh, the exception, from, uh, the exception from, from Article 5 does not, does not apply. So, so here is the special provision on, on the protection of living culture. You know? So moving from the idea that general, general idea of uh, national regulations on on export that 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 that, that the works of living uh, living artists are not um, are not subject to export control usually uh, here uh, or export um, or export um, bans uh, here here uh, here there is a difference uh, in relation to uh, to the special situation of of an object created within a community and using by the community, and and now the stolen, now the stolen, and and here the stolen is pretty is pretty complex, and also Marie 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 Sophie today mentioned that this three year, three year period 
to present evidences that the object was stolen can be very problematic. There is a very famous case, the very famous case of an, of an object, of the collection of objects um, that probably originated from somewhere from central, central South Central uh, Europe, but not, uh, but it was very difficult to, and they ended up in, uh, in UK and it was very difficult to, to, to prove from where they originated. So basically after many years of, of, uh, of, um, of uh, discussions, the, the objects were purchased by the government of Hungary and, 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 and uh, first presented in the parliament and then donated to the National Museum. So, uh, so sometimes, uh, sometimes fewer period can, is not enough. Uh, in other in other cases, like like very briefly, the, the second the second the second picture is a f from the famous Barakat case. He, the issue was was not from where the object was was um, was taken, but whether it was uh, classified as state property. And I think and I think this also this this issue of uh, state property of archaeological object will be approached. Okay, and now and now and now I can I move to next. Uh, so this is so, so this is the, the presentation of this uh, in in Hungary, and then and then the special provision related to to sacred or, or commonly important cultural object belonging and used by tribal by or indigenous community in contracting parties. So so this is uh, so this is so here it's a, it's a very important very important provision that that gives the same time um, status of limitations to. Um, to the objects be, uh, belonging and used by indigenous and tribal communities, as those as those applied to uh, to public collections, and and this um, this this provision appeared very late during the negotiation at the very at the very end. Um, so so and on the on the motion by Australia, supported by uh, by Canada and US. And and um, and what is uh, what is what is what is really really um, what is really important is his, that that to put at the same level the same level of importance uh, the public collections and the object used by communities. And if I may to go to the final, uh, so 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 this is so this is this 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 category. So we put so is the so is the time when. When, uh, when uh, also with support of UNESCO of United Nations during the diplomatic conference, this provision was was uh, was introduced also in light of the, of the decade of indigenous people. Uh, and obviously, obviously, how uh, just briefly how to uh, how to um, how to understand if we can move to the next next how to under to understand the um, the. Um, the notion, the notion of this indigenous and tribal. So obviously, um, the convention itself does not does not explain what uh, uh, what is meant by indigenous. So here, so here, uh, so here, the, um, the reference to uh, United Nations um, documents mu must be does, uh, must be made, especially to the um, to the um, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, which extensively deals with with the question of cultural property, uh, and and to conclude, to con to conclude the last slide, okay. So this so this uh, this this impact, I think I think that the first contribution, a very important contribution, uh, of the of the of the UNIDRA Convention, uh, is the the rise of uh, um, of this um, special value, special value and significance of uh, of uh, um, cultural. Uh, object belonging created and used by communities, but in a sense that that not because of the value themselves, not the value of of the uh, of the author, the history, but the value of the communal use, which is which is which is which is very important, and also the protection of living cultures. So these exceptions to exceptions under Article um, uh, Seven Point Two. Uh, also, also, what is all, uh, what is um, also very important that the removal of the object from its community without uh, the consent of the community may amount to theft. This is also this is also very important. And and uh, and finally, 
a qualify, uh, disqualified spe uh, special time limitations under the conventions for such object giving the same level of protection as public public collection and i think what is what is also evident that this uh, that these elements uh, should should um, be taken into the, into account while drafting policies on managing indigenous and tribal collections and i think we can observe that that this indirect indirect influence of of uh, of uh, um, of this indigenous part uh, of um, of the convention also concerning uh, concerning the special protection the long um, pres prescription periods it's gradually being being observed in in different in different uh, programs or um, internal programs museum pro programs dealing with with indigenous art so thank you very much Thank you, Andre, for your interesting contribution. And I guess now we'll have a video by uh, Professor Patty Gerstenblatt, who is a very well-known expert in this field. She's a distinguished research professor, and she's also director of the Center for Arts, Museum, and Cultural Heritage Law at the DePaul University College of Law in Chicago. Uh, she will be dealing with a totally different uh, issue, which is the state ownership of undiscovered cultural objects, the UNIDRA Convention and the modal provisions, the UNESCO UNIDRA modal provisions. Uh, I also guess that Professor Gerstner Blight will be in remote live, uh, at least for our questions and, and answers. So let's, let's look at the video. Good morning. I want to begin by thanking Maria Schneider for inviting me to participate in this conference celebrating the 20th anniversary of I particularly want to thank her staff for enabling me to participate remotely in this event. I want to thank Eja Eliolu Yodici for sharing with me a recently completed PhD thesis under the supervision of Professor Mark Andre Renaud on the subject of state ownership of cultural property. It is a particular honor for me to be included in this conference, which is such an important recognition of advances in the protection of cultural heritage through the 1995 Inuit Convention and its associated legal developments. For this discussion on the question of protection of archaeological heritage, I define looting as the unscientific removal of artifacts from the ground and the dismemberment of ancient structures and monuments. Looting of archaeological sites is a worldwide phenomenon, illustrated here by this looted archaeological site in southern Iraq, probably looted shortly after the U.S. invasion in 2003. It afflicts all kinds of countries, both wealthy and the poorer countries, and is carried out with the profits that can be earned through the international art market. Looting also poses particular harms through the destruction of archaeological context, illustrated here in four different ways, showing the stratigraphy of sites, and the accompanying losses to our knowledge and understanding of the past. Looting therefore raises particular issues of public interest that are not implicated in the trade and cultural objects that were previously known. It is necessary for both international law and domestic law to impose consequences on those who engage in traffic Imposing such consequences serves the purpose of reducing the economic incentive to loot and thereby reduce the demand. Other cultural objects may also be undocumented for their theft. Ethnographic objects, particularly indigenous ones, may not be recorded due to religious precepts. Other cultural objects may not be documented for practical reasons, such as lack of financial resources or technological capacity. However, archaeological objects looted from the ground are unique because, by definition, it is not possible to document them before they are looted and traded onto the international market. We see here a diagram uh, created by Professor Morak Purcell of three stages through which archaeological artifacts may pass in the market. The bottom of the pyramid is the production phase. This is the looting of sites and the initial movement of objects. The distribution phase is the movement of objects 
for the market. We can call these transit countries while recognizing that in many cases, the market may be within one country as well. The third stage is consumption. This is when the objects surface, perhaps in a public collection such as a museum or a private collection of high-end collectors. The undocumented nature of archaeological objects makes them particularly suitable for criminal activities such as money laundering and financing of terrorism and armed conflict. Their undocumented nature also presents significant challenges to the legal system. For this reason, distinctive legal doctrines have developed to counter trafficking in undocumented archaeological objects. These specialized doctrines doctrines supplement the standard legal approaches to the recovery of stolen documented objects. Beginning over a century ago, many states with the rich archaeological heritage, such as Turkey and Italy, began enacting enact investing laws. When such objects are looted and taken from the country without an export license, the goal is for these objects to be recognized as stolen property in the market countries. In which case, the laws of those countries that prohibit importing, exporting, handling, and selling of stolen property would apply equally to such archaeological artifacts. While there are many steps that the state's of origin, that is the country where an artifact is discovered in modern times, can take domestically to protect its archaeological heritage, the step that the international community can take is harmonization of the laws between those of states of origin and those of transit and destination market states. The Unique Law Convention and the model provisions on state ownership of undiscovered cultural objects demonstrate two of the steps that can be taken. Recognition of a foreign investing law was first tested in federal prosecutions in the United States in the 1970s, particularly the prosecution of dealers for attempting to traffic in antiquities from Guatemala and Mexico. The conviction of these dealers caused outrage in the U.S. antiquities market, but the doctrine was reaffirmed 2003 conviction of a prominent New York dealer for conspiring the British conservator to trade in antiquities removed and removed from Egypt. And here you see the head of the pharaoh on the third um, on the left as it was restored and on the right as it was smuggled out of Egypt. The court characterized the antiquities as stolen. that the analysis of foreign state ownership is not nearly as detailed or exacting as that used in the Schultz prosecution, likely because it is a civil rather than a criminal action. UK courts used a comparable approach to allow a civil suit by Iran against the Barakat Gallery in London in the attempt to recover artifacts looted from the Giraffe Cemetery in southwestern Iran. In analyzing the Iranian investing statute, the UK court held that it was enough if Iran established it had a superior title to the artifacts, even if it could not prove definitively the title to the artifacts invested in Iran before they were looted. Again, perhaps this lower bar was applied because this was an action for return of the artifacts and not a criminal case. It is clearly in the interest of the international community that the vesting statutes of the countries of origin 
and the judicial approaches of transit and destination market states dovetail. If they do, state ownership becomes an effective way of denying the finder, the middleman, and the ultimate purchaser any rights, including title, to the artifacts. If those involved in the trafficking lose their economic investment and more importantly risk criminal conviction, then the economic incentive of the market will be reduced. This brings me to the question of how the UNIDWA Convention and the model provisions can fill a potential gap between the countries of origin and the mar market countries. In doing so, we should think of two sides of the equation, supply side, that is the countries of origin, and the demand side, the transit and destination market countries, while recognizing some states may be both. In doing so, we can see that there are legal mechanisms that can be put in place on each side of the equation that will reduce the incentive to loot, to loot artifacts. The first such legal mechanism is the UNIDWA Convention itself, Article 3.2. This is something that both sides of the equation need to do, in other words, ratify the convention, in order to maximize its effectiveness. However, as we shall see, some market states have undertaken unilateral steps that may achieve the same result. Article 3.2 of the Convention states, a cultural object which has been unlawfully excavated, or lawfully excavated but unlawfully retained, shall be considered stolen when consistent with the law of the state where the excavation took place. This accomplishes the purpose of characterizing the object as stolen property. However, it is worth noting that this provision goes further than a vesting statute in that it applies not only to objects that are legally excavated, but also to ones that have been, may have been legally excavated or un, and unlawfully retained. Exactly how broadly this applies is as yet untested. For example, some countries may not vest ownership of undiscovered artifacts in the nation, but may require that an individual who accidentally discovers an artifact to give notice to government authorities of the discovery within a limited time period. The failure to give notice and turn the object over to the government would constitute unlawful retention, and the object would be characterized as stolen in another state party. It is interesting to note that some states that ratified only the 1970 UNESCO Convention and not the UNIDWA Convention nonetheless adopted provisions that are similar to or influenced by Article 3.2. One of these is the Netherlands, which did so explicitly by prohibiting the import of unlawfully appropriated cultural objects and defining unlawful appropriation to include unlawful excavation at archaeological sites. The second country is the United Kingdom, which was less directly influenced, or at least did not state the direct influence, uh, by prohibiting the dealing in tainted cultural objects, defined as objects whose removal or excavation constitutes an offense under local law. Uh, that is the law where the excavation took place. We can see that the Egyptian law of uh, 117 at issue in the Schultz case is a good example of a vesting law. In Article 1, it clearly defines what an antiquity is, an immovable or immovable property that is the product of any of the various civilizations down to a point 100 years before the present. Article 6 is a clear statement that all antiquities are public property. In other words, they are owned by the state. And Article 7 prohibits any trade in antiquities. The model provisions on state ownership of undiscovered cultural objects pick up on these points. The first is a definition. Uh, the definition adopted in the provision is clear enough. Objects of importance to archaeology, prehistory, history, literature, art, or science, and are located in the soil or underwater. However, there is no time limit uh, put there. So it may in fact be less clear and it would be advisable for countries to adopt a time limit similar to the Egyptian statute. Provision three is a clear statement of ownership uh, with grandfathering in as is typical objects that are under prior uh, and proper legal ownership. And provision four picks up on Article 3.2 of the UNIDWA Convention by including illegally retained objects uh, to be deemed stolen objects. This is a significant step forward if but only if states of origin use these provisions to fashion their laws. I acknowledge that this is putting the onus on these countries to model their laws in ways that will be satisfactory to courts in, the United, in market states. 
Nonetheless, it is a reality that since these objects appear in market states and the actors, at least in the, at the end of the market chain, are typically located in market states, this is necessary in order to achieve the ultimate goal of bringing legal means to bear on denying title to such objects and thereby reducing the incentive to loot. In closing, the final point I would like to make is that while there is reason for optimism, I am also somewhat discouraged by some aspects of the UN Security Council resolutions 2199 and 2347 that dealt in the former specifically with looting of sites in Syria and Iraq, and the latter more broadly with the problem of trafficking and cultural objects. I am disappointed because the international community twice missed the opportunity to recognize at the international level the vesting laws of Iraq and Syria specifically, and more globally, the legitimacy of state ownership. These resolutions did not call for states to uniformly adopt vesting statutes into their domestic legal system, and did not call for universal recognition of such vesting laws in the courts of market states. Therefore, I would conclude that while significant advances have been made in the past 25 years toward the use of legal mechanisms to reduce market incentives, to loot, much still remains to be done. Thank you. Thank you, and let's move uh, to the last but not least uh, contribution, and we'll switch to French. C'est le temps maintenant de, de Vincent Negri, qui est un chercheur à l'Institut des sciences sociales de polit du politique, CNRS École Normale Supérieure de Paris-Saclay, Université de Paris-Nanterre. Et permettez-moi de souligner qu'il a largement aussi contribué à la réalisation du célèbre rapport Sar Savoir, qui a été réalisé en 2018. Et, et, et d'ailleurs, je crois que la France vient d'adopter une loi spéciale pour euh, permettre la restitution de certains biens au Sénégal et au Bénin. Donc, c'est juste l'occasion de, de, de le souligner. Mais la, la contribution de, de Vincent euh, concerne le, un problème qui n'est pas tellement abordé normalement, le problème de la non-rétroactivité, mais pas de légitimité. Tu as la parole, Vincent. Merci beaucoup, Manlio. Donc, euh, effectivement, comme tu le soulignes, la, la, France est en, enfin, la loi n'a pas encore été adoptée. Elle est en cours de discussion devant le Parlement pour permettre la restitution d'objets pris pendant la période coloniale, donc s'agissant d'objets béninois et d'un objet en provenance du Sénégal. Mais on a peut-être l'occasion d'en reparler, donc je vais aborder mon propos. Donc, euh, je voudrais, avant de, de commencer, bien évidemment, je dirais que, euh, souligner le plaisir que j'ai d'être ici et, et remercier Unidroit et particulièrement Marina de cette invitation à prendre part à cet anniversaire. Donc, euh, non-rétroactivité et légitimité, donc je vais tenter d'explorer les rapports qu'il y a entre ces deux termes. Euh, rétroactivité, non-rétroactivité, légitimité, ce sont, enfin, si on prend les deux termes, rétroactivité et légitimité, ce sont deux termes qui agissent dans des registres totalement distincts. Le premier, le premier euh, la rétroactivité, s'inscrit dans un système de normes juridiques, alors que le second ne relève pas d'une normativité juridique, il se réfère à une qualité fondée sur un système de valeurs issues de la morale, de la philosophie, voire du droit. Mais d'abord, une qualité. Donc, euh, et je situerai mon propos, bien évidemment, dans le, dans le sillage que... que Manlio Frigo a, a, a dévoilé, c'est-à-dire que comment euh, ces deux notions euh, prennent place dans la restitution des biens culturels qui ont été pris pendant la période coloniale. Et donc, bien évidemment, d'abord une question de vocabulaire, puisque euh, autant euh, la question de la rétroactivité et la légitimité je dire, que sont à peu près définies, mais je vais revenir dessus, parce que la... la définition peut-être moins évidente qu'il n'y paraît, euh, sur la question de la dépossession des biens culturels pendant la période coloniale. Vous voyez sur l'écran, il y a une multitude de termes qui peuvent être mobilisés. Donc, comment ces termes peuvent-ils rentrer dans le champ du droit international et donc euh, permettre de qualifier des, des dépossessions de biens culturels donc, avant d'aborder la question des biens culturels pris par la période coloniale, je vais d'abord tenter de préciser le vocabulaire. Alors, la non-rétroactivité, 
C'est l'application d'une norme à des situations ou à des faits survenus avant son entrée en vigueur. Euh, C'est en fait l'applicabilité exclue d'une norme à des situations ou à des faits survenus avant l'entrée en vigueur de la norme, sauf indication contraire de l'auteur de la norme. C'est ce que nous dit Jean Salmon dans le dictionnaire de droit international public. Et c'est le même principe que pose, bien évidemment, l'article 28 de la Convention de Vienne sur le droit des traités, qui nous rappelle, dans son article 28, qui précise que, à moins qu'une intention différente ne ressorte du traité ou ne soit par ailleurs établie, les dispositions d'un traité ne lient pas une partie en ce qui concerne un acte ou fait antérieur à la date d'entrée en vigueur de ce traité, au regard de cette partie, ou une situation qui avait cessé d'exister à cette date. À ce stade-là, deux observations. La non-rétroactivité est la règle. Deuxième point, la non-rétroactivité est la condition de l'acceptation par les États de la légalité internationale. C'est ce que nous rappelle la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme dans, un, dans une affaire tranchée le 8 mars 2006, Belgique contre Croatie, où la CEDH nous dit qu'il est vrai qu'à compter de la date de la ratification d'une convention, tous les actes et omissions de l'État contractant doivent être conformes à la Convention. Toutefois, celle-ci n'impose à cet État aucune obligation spécifique de redresser les injustices ou dommages causés avant qu'il ne ratifie la Convention. La CDH poursuit en disant « toute autre approche saperait à la fois le principe de non-rétroactivité que consacre le droit des traités » et la distinction fondamentale entre violation et réparation qui sous-tend le droit de la responsabilité des États. La notion de rétroactivité est donc stricte, elle ne souffre pas d'interprétation, c'est en ce sens que le préambule de la Convention Unidroit de 1995 rappelle que l'adoption des dispositions de la présente Convention valent pour l'avenir. La référence à la non-rétroactivité ne permet pas une grande marge d'interprétation. Tel n'est pas le cas de la notion de légitimité. Comme concept, la légitimité s'inscrit dans la langue et la culture juridique de manière hétérogène et polysémique. Et on trouve de nombreuses références à la légitimité ou à son épithète légitime dans le droit international du patrimoine culturel. Juste quelques exemples, l'article 13 de la Convention de 70 de l'UNESCO nous parle du propriétaire légitime, l'article 5 de la Convention de 54 fait référence au gouvernement légitime, l'article 13 du deuxième protocole fait référence aux moyens légitimes, hein, défendre l'unité nationale et l'intégrité territoriale de l'État par tous les moyens légitimes, et l'article 10 de la Convention en droit nous dit que la présente convention ne légitime aucunement une opération illicite de quelque nature qu'elle soit qui ait eu lieu avant l'entrée en vigueur de la présente convention. Donc, dans ces déterminations, la légitimité enveloppe l'idée de ce qui est juste. Elle confirme le bien fondé de la règle juridique. Comme le souligne Simone Goyard-Fabre, quand on s'interroge sur l'acception juridique de la notion de légitimité, le problème est de déterminer dans un système de droit positif les rapports qu'elle entretient, d'une part avec la légalité, d'autre part avec les requêtes du monde social et l'horizon des valeurs. Donc, ambivalence de la légitimité entre légalité et horizon des valeurs. C'est dans cette ambivalence que s'inscrit la restitution des biens culturels soustraits à leur communauté d'origine pendant la période coloniale et conservés aujourd'hui dans les musées des anciennes puissances coloniales européennes. Concernant l'horizon des valeurs auxquelles fait référence Simone Goyard-Fabre, une cartographie de cet horizon a été dressée par Amadou Magtarambo en 1978, alors qu'il était directeur général de l'UNESCO, euh, il publie donc un appel pour le retour à ceux qui l'ont créé d'un patrimoine culturel irremplaçable et il écrit euh, encore, voilà, il écrit euh, aussi bien ces hommes et ces femmes démunis demandent-il que leur soient restitués au moins les trésors d'art les plus représentatifs de leur culture, ceux auxquels il attache le plus d'importance, ceux dont l'absence leur est psychologiquement le plus intolérable. Il conclut en disant « cette revendication est légitime ». De quelle légitimité est-il question Il ne s'agit 
évidemment pas de celle qui sanctifie la légalité internationale. Bien au contraire, à la légitimité que postule la pensée d'Amadou Maktambo, on peut transposer les analyses de René Jean Dupuis. La suivante. René Jean Dupuis écrit « Cette légitimité dénonce l'injustice de nombre de règles de la légalité positive et anticipe sur la légalité de demain. Dans le champ de la restitution ou du retour des biens culturels, les rapports entre non-rétroactivité et légitimité nous renvoient à une prédétermination de la légalité internationale Prédétermination qui exclut les arbitrages de la légitimité fondée sur les valeurs sociales auxquelles faisait référence Simone Goyarfa. C'est ainsi qu'est obérée la faculté de penser la légalité de demain à laquelle renvoie René Jean Dupuis. Nous connaissons ces règles de la légalité internationale qui sont autant de symptômes d'injustice lorsqu'elles fondent des fins de non-recevoir opposées à des États qui revendiquent aujourd'hui un patrimoine spolié pendant la période coloniale et dont ont été dépouillés par la violence des populations et des communautés. Ce sont ces règles qu'Amadou Maktambo déborde en fondant sa doctrine du retour sur le concept de légitimité. Donc, opposition entre l'égalité et légitimité, autrement dit, nous serions confrontés à une invitation à choisir entre deux points de vue qui s'opposent, et une telle invitation présupposerait qu'une même décision ou un même acte, formellement conforme au droit, peut cependant être contraire à un principe de légitimité politique ou morale. C'est précisément dans cette opposition entre l'égalité internationale et légitimité des revendications que s'inscrit aujourd'hui le parcours des demandes de restitution de biens culturels soustraits pendant la période coloniale. Mais on peut également tenter de dépasser l'alternative et soutenir que les deux termes ne s'opposent pas. Ce dépassement de l'alternative requiert d'identifier un terrain commun aux deux notions. Et dans ce terrain commun, on pourrait promouvoir l'idée de justice. L'idée de justice comme point de rencontre entre la légalité internationale et la légitimité, pour refonder le rapport juridique que sous-tend et provoque la restitution. À ce stade, nous pouvons faire un détour par la théorie du droit et regarder ce que Gustave Radbrook écrit dans son texte sur injustice légale et droit supralégal. La formule de Radbrook comprend deux thèses, qui sont celles de l'échec du positivisme juridique et celles de l'injustice démesurée ou évidente. Radbrook reproche au positivisme juridique d'avoir pour seul critère de validité la conformité du droit aux règles de procédure et une efficacité sociale. On entrevoit sans peine ce que peut recouvrir la conformité du droit aux règles de procédure dans le traitement des demandes de restitution. De même que l'efficacité sociale dont rend compte, par exemple, le principe d'inaliénabilité des collections publiques. Pour autant, sans remettre en cause ce principe, l'inaliénabilité peut-elle être durablement l'unité de mesure des réponses aux légitimités des revendications de biens culturels Selon Radbrook, l'idée de justice doit tenir compte de trois degrés d'injustice. Premier degré, le principe de la sécurité du droit requiert que le droit positif reste en vigueur, même s'il est matériellement injuste et inapproprié. Nous avons tous en tête des exemples sur ce cas. Deuxièmement, il peut y avoir des cas d'espèce où le degré d'injustice, c'est-à-dire l'opposition de la norme juridique avec l'idée de la justice, devient démesuré ou insupportable. Il s'agit là des cas limites où les normes perdent, selon Radbrook, leur validité juridique. Troisième cas, dans tous les cas où les normes sont extrêmement injustes, où l'injustice est évidente, celles-ci sont d'emblée dénuées de validité juridique. On observera la radicalité hein, du propos de Radbrook. Le recours au droit supralégal requiert que des actes commis dans le passé soient toutefois constitutifs encore d'un conflit juridique, donc un conflit qui persiste dans le présent. Pour résoudre ce conflit, il peut alors être nécessaire de revenir sur les normes et les décisions juridiques du passé. Ce que Gustave Radbrook exprime en soulignant, 
que lorsque la contradiction de la loi positive avec la justice atteint un degré tellement insupportable, la loi en tant que droit non juste doit céder à la justice. C'est cette voie que trace, peu ou prou, le rapport remis à Emmanuel Macron le 23 novembre 2018, rédigé sous la responsabilité de Faye Winsar et Bénédicte Savoie. Et donc, ce rapport fait suite à un discours prononcé par Emmanuel Macron, vous le voyez en train de prononcer ce discours à l'université de Ouagadougou en novembre 2017, il a l'air aspiré, et vous voyez effectivement ce qu'il écrit. Voilà. Il pose un principe, il dit voilà, le patrimoine africain ne peut pas être uniquement dans des collections privées et des musées européens, et donc il veut effectivement instaurer un une circulation, un dialogue, voire une restitution, puisque finalement, il conclut en disant « Je veux que d'ici cinq ans, les conditions soient réunies pour des restitutions temporaires ou définitives. » La formule, pour les juristes, nous laisse un petit peu en lévitation, hein, puisque autant nous savons ce qu'est une restitution définitive, et par, par définition, elle est définitive, autant la restitution temporaire nous laisse dans un état un peu enfin, d'incertitude, dirons-nous. Imaginez, il s'agit de circulation de dépôts. Mais ne remettons pas en cause la parole présidentielle. Donc, euh, Emmanuel Macron commande donc à Bénédicte Savoie et Fabien Sarr ce rapport euh, auquel j'ai eu euh, l'honneur de participer. Et donc, ce rapport euh, trace euh, une voie pour penser la légalité de demain. Euh, et euh, j'aime particulièrement, effectivement, le, 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 le sous-titre « Vers une nouvelle éthique » relationnel, donc il s'agit, et vous verrez effectivement ce qu'en dit Felwin notamment, il s'agit d'une éthique relationnelle repensée. Au-delà des réactions parfois vives que ce rapport a suscité, pour le moins, la trajectoire qu'il trace est loin des excès que certains ont cru pouvoir relever. Le principe directeur qui pourrait forger une matrice pour penser la légalité de demain, on vous renvoie à ce que disait René-Jean Dupuis, L'égalité de demain fondée sur la légitimité dans l'acception que lui attribue Amadou Maktarambo tient en quelques lignes. Penser la légalité de demain présuppose toutefois que soit réglée, évacuée, la question de la non-rétroactivité des traités internationaux qui, à la charnière des 19e et 20e siècles, ont codifié le droit de la guerre. Et donc, cette codification a installé dans le droit international les ferments d'un principe d'immunité des biens culturels lors des conflits armés. Mais faire de la non-rétroactivité le principe axiologique qui gouverne la recevabilité des revendications relève d'une conception européo-centrée du droit international. Pour autant, il ne s'agit pas de passer outre la non-rétroactivité mais d'interroger davantage la validité de l'argumentation fondée sur l'opposabilité des conventions de l'AE de 1899 et de 1907 pour régler la réponse aux spoliations coloniales. L'affirmation de l'opposabilité des conventions aux spoliations coloniales permet, s'agissant des spoliations hantées 1899, de déduire l'absence de principe d'immunité en raison de la non-rétroactivité des conventions. Il est alors loisible de revêtir des attributs de la légalité internationale, des pillages et des soustractions de biens culturels, en rappelant le droit au butin hérité du droit romain et en inscrivant ainsi ces pillages dans une tradition multiséculaire qui vient au renfort de la légalité internationale. Donc, vous avez vu donc, les deux diapos. Donc, la première concernait, le, 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 si on peut revenir en arrière, donc, le, la première concernée, donc, les objets pris en 1896 par les troupes françaises commandées par le général Dotz, donc, lors d'une bataille à Abomé au Bénin. Et donc, vous avez effectivement un extrait du petit journal. Hein, donc, euh, vous voyez effectivement donc, la légende qui est indiquée. Euh, et puis, euh, ces statues aujourd'hui, donc, vous les voyez au musée de Québranly. Il est question de ces statues dans le projet de loi actuellement débattu devant le Parlement français. Et sur la diapo suivante, donc, vous voyez effectivement donc, une photo hein, que l'on connaît bien hein, avec la légende. C'est les, les, les membres de l'expédition punitive britannique en 1897 qui euh, posent fièrement devant leur, leur butin. Et vous voyez quand même la symbolique, hein, la symbolique très romaine, justement, hein, le trophée posé au pied des vainqueurs. 
un trophée qui constitue le butin. Et donc, vous voyez effectivement après, donc, dans une gazette londonienne, donc, la, 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 la narration de ce pillage, de cette spoliation. Et donc, nombre de ces objets sont conservés aujourd'hui au British Museum, mais pas qu'au pas qu'au seul British Museum, vous en avez également à Berlin, par exemple, ou également aux USA. Donc, euh, l'affirmation de l'opposabilité, je reviens sur mon propos sur l'opposabilité des conventions, sur la validité hein, de l'argumentation fondée sur l'opposabilité des conventions de l'AE de 1899 et de 1907 pour régler la réponse aux spoliations coloniales. L'affirmation de l'opposabilité des conventions aux spoliations coloniales permet, s'agissant des spoliations hantées 1899, excusez-moi, je suis en train de me répéter. Alors, je, re, je, je continue. Donc, raisonner ainsi, c'est opérer un raccourci en oblitérant la situation internationale de l'Afrique au XIXe siècle et singulièrement dans la seconde moitié de ce siècle dès lors que la conférence de Berlin de 1885 a entériné la conquête coloniale. C'est alors que s'est imposée, et je cite Isabelle Choutetakov, s'est imposée une perspective eurocentrique et positiviste qui nie au peuple non européen une personnalité juridique internationale, déclare leur territoire terra nullius et fait dépendre leur reconnaissance internationale de leur civilisation sous l'égide des puissances européennes. Je vous renvoie au traité de Versailles et au pacte de la Société des Nations, de 1919. Un détour par l'anthropologie du droit international tranche la question de la validité du droit international qui vient opposer une fin de non recevoir aux revendications de biens culturels soustraits aux populations africaines lors des guerres coloniales au cours de la seconde moitié du 19e siècle. Comme le souligne Isabelle Chotetinkoff, on observe deux perspectives opposées sur l'histoire du droit des gens et celle du droit international. L'une dominante est eurocentrique, y voit un système de règles de droit public liant les nations civilisées d'Europe, fondées sur des coutumes et des valeurs communes à celles-ci. L'autre, plus critique du point de vue anthropologique et historiographique, est aussi mieux informée de la nature d'ordres juridiques non européens, cultive une approche décentrée pour résister au raisonnement ex post facto qui projette dans le passé la configuration actuelle des relations internationales et du système étatique. Dès lors que le droit de la guerre, codifié par les conventions de la haie de 1899 et 1907, ne vient donc plus faire écran sur les revendications, ni légaliser les pillages et spoliations par le jeu de la non-rétroactivité de ces conventions, la question de la légitimité pour penser la légalité de demain acquiert une densité normative singulière. Notre manière de penser les droits des autres est formatée par une tradition philosophique hegelienne. Suleiman Bachir Ndian, le grand philosophe sénégalais, Suleiman Bachir Ndian, le rappelle. L'Europe est l'universel et le reste du monde doit se régler sur elle. Cette idée remonte à Hegel, pour qui une région n'existe qu'à partir du moment où l'Europe pose son regard sur elle ou lorsqu'un Européen y met les pieds. Il poursuit en disant « Il est temps de repenser l'universel, de considérer qu'il n'y a pas d'humanité séparée et qu'il n'y a pas un lieu qui serait le seul théâtre de l'histoire universelle. » Je conclurai en, 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 en rappelant la phrase d'Amagdou Mantarbo qui nous dit « Cette revendication est légitime, écrivait-il en 78. La légitimité et peut-être aussi l'équité peuvent orienter la manière dont nous pouvons penser la légalité de demain pour reprendre la formule de René-Jean Dupuis. » Je vous remercie. Merci Vincent pour, pour cette contribution. Now we, we have finished with our speakers and I'm very thankful to all of them. And we have some minutes and uh, we, for, for some questions and answers. I guess we have collected some uh, queries. Yes, indeed, we have a question for uh, Madame de Clipel. Um, Uh, asking, how is the provenance of the object you took as an example? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I saw that uh, uh, Antoinette asked two questions. I will uh, try to answer them as best as I can. So um, maybe the, the second question about the qualification of the owner to start with. Um, 
in, actually in my in my model I tried to present here, which is more of course some kind of theoretical model, I would not depart from the qualification of owner. To me, remaining an owner is important, but the ownership right itself would be rethought. And this is not something that it's, is completely um, out, of, out of touch because uh, we in Belgium have a new civil code which will enter into force in a few months and where you have this idea of social function of property and where you see that the owner himself actually uh, doesn't have this absolute ownership right to do whatever he wants and to have this exclusive right and individual right on his object. And so that's why I think if you, if you interpret the social function broadly, you can also see that there is a cultural function in case of a cultural object and that the owner anyway has this duty of care and, 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 um, and, and, and should also share rights with uh, this fundamental right to access, use and enjoyment of uh, cultural heritage. Now concerning the um, the, the provenance of the object. Now the object is of course here um, an African object with colonial collections. So this makes the, 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 the example uh, even more actual. Um, and my idea was to show that you can already have this shared interest and this, this sharing of rights on the object without necessarily immediately going to the restitution matter as Vincent Negri explained very clearly and where you have all this ambivalence about how to think about restitution uh, itself, but you can already um, see it for um, the, the, the several rights that can be attached to this object. Now it could be another object that is uh, an object in, in a church or an art collection or whatever um, for, for the, the movable objects. I hope this answers the questions. Thank you. We have a second question for Marie-Sophie de, de Kripel, if, while you are on the line. Um, just, okay. uh, another question was, why do you still use the qualification of owner? Yes, sorry, uh, I, I just, I took those two questions together um, when, when it was raised because I saw it in the Q&A. So the idea of, of using still owner is because I would not depart of completely of this, of the ownership right, but reformulate it from itself. Thank you. We have another question for the floor. Uh, why, does the nine, uh, why does the 1995 convention provide for automatic return in case of stolen cultural objects, Article 3.1, but no automatic return in case of illegally exported cultural objects? Um, the reason for the difference is that um, in the field of stolen cultural objects, um, everybody agrees on the fact that theft is, is something uh, reprehensible. So uh, giving an automatic uh, effect to uh, the uh, restitution of, of cultural objects is, was admissible to all those um, in the uh, drafting of the convention. On the other side, um, the, um, in the illegal export field, uh, there's much less, um, or there was at the time much less uh, convergence of interest. You have the market states and you have the states of origin. So in that respect, um, because the difference of interests was, were, uh, or the interests were very different, um, the convention decided, or the, the, the drafters of the convention decided that there could not be an automatic uh, return of illicitly exported objects, but it would have to be based on certain conditions, which are uh, the conditions you find um, in uh, in the convention. Uh, uh, the participant would like to know if uh, which are the actions that Interpol um, uh, has carried out against uh, illicit traffic of uh, cultural property, and also how uh, many objects may we find on the database with Interpol. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. In, in the Interpol Student Works of our database, we have approximately. 51,000 objects stolen, reported as stolen, from 134 member countries. We have to highlight that all objects that are stored in the Interpol Zone Works of our database are uh, missing objects and reported by the police as stolen and missing. It means that in the Interpol Zone Works of our database, that is a police database, even if from 2009 is open to the public, to the general public, you will find all objects 
that were reported by the police and reported by, uh, by our National Central Bureau to us and we inserted in. As main actions that Interpol is carried out to fight the illicit traffic of cultural property, we have uh, several activities, but for sure, the most important activity is to connect police for sharing information and to try to fast the process of the investigations that are in. Because when you are talking about uh, organized crime, when you are talking about uh, the illicit traffic of cultural property, we need to be faster than, uh, than the criminals. Well, the most important thing is to share this information among us and to support our member countries in uh, identify, locate, and recover the stolen or illicit excavated objects of art. Of course, we are also uh, carrying out other uh, activities. The core activities, of course, uh, is to uh, update and to encourage our member countries to uh, send us as much as possible information about the stolen objects of art, to have more items in. And uh, we are also uh, making uh, trainings, uh, workshops, uh, conferences uh, to raise awareness about the illicit traffic on cultural property. We are analyzing all data that we have to understand the weakness of the fight against the illicit traffic uh, to try to find solutions that we can share with our um, international organizations and uh, with, other, uh, with other nations. And of course, one of the main action is also to carry out uh, uh, regional and global operations with uh, uh, our regional and uh, international organizations. Thanks for the question. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have a question specific to uh, Nepal from the Inspector General of the Armed Police Force. Um, in, he, uh, he states that there are estimates that still many of Nepalese antiquities are in foreign countries and uh, was wondering if there were some initiatives originated from international, uh, from the international community that these works of art and works of worship, which, was illegally which were illegally transported from Nepal, are now being displayed in different renowned museums in the world. And he wanted to know if they would be returned. I don't know who would like to answer, but first of all, I think that there's a point that missing in the question is, is there any, any request by, the, by a requesting state, which is a, a condition uh, that must be filled? Otherwise, the, if there's no request, there will be no automatic answer or and or return or restitution. This is my, as far as I understand the, the, the issue that's raised in the question. And uh, there's another question by Alessandro Keiki. Please, you have the floor. Good, good morning. Uh, also, I would like to congratulate Unidroa and say happy birthday. Um, Keiki Alessandro from the University of Geneva. I have um, one, a few questions for uh, the speakers. Uh, one is for... Um, uh, Marie-Sophie de Clippel. Uh, I was uh, intrigued by the um, this uh, theoretical, um, this new idea of cultural property of shared interest. And I, I was wondering, how can we convince owners to give up somehow the exclusive powers and rights and to share? So, the, the, the system is nice, but then I was wondering how do we convince owners they are already in possession of objects, perhaps they don't want to um, share with others. And then I have a question for um, uh, Professor Renold and uh, Vrolchak. I don't know if she's still with us. I was wondering if the definitions uh, and idea of due diligence uh, we have uh, um, can also apply uh, beyond the usual contests of uh, uh, sales in auction houses in the big cities we know, and if this concept or the examples that we find in the Unidua Convention can be extended in other settings like uh, online sales. So do we need to adjust this definition or it's fine as it, as it is? Thank you. Marie-Sophie? 
Yes, okay, thank you. If you want to, to maybe to, to answer. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor Chetri, for your interesting question. It's, of course, uh, difficult to answer. Um, this idea of sharing is not only just based on, um, on, 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 on just an idea, but actually, if you look at the, the laws protecting cultural heritage, both movable and immovable, they already limit the, the absolute and exclusive power of the owner to do whatever he wants with the object. So it's actually already in the law that he doesn't, that, that there is some kind of burden linked to this object. Now it's quite obvious if in the case of immovable objects that there is this kind of sharing with, with uh, some, some, somehow access to the good in, in a way or another. It's more delicate, of course, with cultural objects, movable ones. Uh, but there, I think if, if you uh, work together with this uh, financial incentives, subsidies are often linked to some, somehow open it up to uh, a more collective interest because we're not just in front of a normal object but one having some kind of collective interest for cultural heritage. Uh, you, can, you can work together on this idea of sharing, um, maybe also through digital means uh, to make the access more public and then you can uh, incentivize the owner to share because he already has this kind of framework that, that opens uh, the ownership rights. Thank you. Thank you, marie Sofian. Maybe Marc-André Reynold would like to answer also. On the second question that um, Alessandro Kriki asked on the uh, due diligence and internet, um, perhaps uh, uh, Anna will want to add uh, something on that. Um, I would just mention the fact that the convention itself uh, can be interpreted in a way which allows, of course, uh, that all circumstances be taken into consideration. So that general con clause can, of course, include any additional elements that would be uh, uh, available, uh, for example, on internet. And I would also add that, of course, the issue there is going to be the issue of proof. How am I going to be able to prove that I was a diligent purchaser on internet. And that's going to be difficult. Uh, and for example, it would be very important to keep any evidence uh, that the person who purchased on internet uh, checked uh, every possible site and got all the information they wanted. So it will be very important in that particular case for the person to keep traces uh, of this uh, actual um, um, consultation of everything. So I think that's, that's going to be the main element, proving that you are in due diligence. But perhaps Anna would like to add something in particular with regard to internet sales. I would say that it's gone beyond internet sales. Something, um, what is interesting is that as a result of the due diligence that was forecast in the 1995 convention, what we have now is successive and repeated um, requirements by the international community that buyers both look at what is now readily available on the internet, that is a national da law databases, whether it be the UNESCO one or others, and also um, lists of stolen property such as the Interpol and also the ICOM red list. So that because of their being so readily accessible, this requirement around due diligence and the verification that Professor Reynolds refer references have been repeatedly mentioned in Security Council resolutions and in other resolutions by the international community since the early 2000s. So this requirement goes now, and it was first stated in the UNIDUAR Convention, now, but now and one could almost say that it's part of customary law, if it's public international law, is a requirement that goes beyond that. And it's because of its accessibility, because of the internet, that information. So it's a really important development that I can't stress enough in relation to this field is that intervention by um, the readily available information on both those fronts and the requirement to prove that through documentation is required on buyers now. Thank you, Anna. I think we have another, another question. Marina, s'il te plaît. Je vais la lire. La question 
euh, vient de la division de culture de la CDAO. Et la question est la suivante. Quelle est la pertinence de l'adoption de la Convention Unidroit dans le contexte des négociations pour le retour des biens culturels à leur pays d'origine La question principale que je me pose, c'est quel est l'intérêt pour les pays d'adopter la Convention Unidroit si nous savons que la plupart des biens volés ou pillés dont nous réclamons le retour ont été exportés à une période lointaine, donc ne pourraient pas s'appliquer dans le cadre de ces chantiers Je pose tout de suite une deuxième question. La deuxième question, enfin, quelle chance donnerait-on à une révision de cette convention ou à un autre acte juridique international qui permettrait de prendre en compte le retour des biens culturels à leur pays d'origine Merci. Euh, euh, je voudrais seulement essayer de répondre à la dernière question et, et après je donne la parole à Vincent Negri. Pour, euh, je crois que la révision de la convention du droit soit hors de discussion, premièrement parce que ce n'est pas prévu par la convention elle-même, et, et je dirais, j'ajouterais que du point de vue de la politique euh, du droit, c'est quelque chose que c'est probablement mieux d'éviter. Euh, oui, euh, et il, faut, il faut ajouter que même de, le cas de la Convention d'UNESCO de 1970, euh, on a pensé que c'était beaucoup mieux, au lieu de réviser la Convention, de demander à UNIDROIT de, de, de rédiger une autre Convention. Et d'ailleurs, c'est tellement difficile de négocier de telles conditions au niveau international que ça explique les difficultés que ces conventions internationales ont d'obtenir de, de, de consensus. Mais peut-être Vincent veut répondre à la première question. Merci, Mandio. Donc, euh, sur la, la, la première question qui est de euh, savoir finalement quel est. Pourquoi ratifier la Convention du droit lorsque l'on engage un processus de restitution de biens culturels pris par la période coloniale, puisque cette Convention, finalement, ne traite pas de cette question-là Alors, je crois, je crois qu'il faut, qu enfin, faut regarder les choses en face. Est que, euh, et quel est l'état du droit international sur, cette, sur euh, la question de la restitution Alors, euh, on a, je vais parler d'une un, jurisprudence française qui illustre parfaitement cette question-là. C'est-à-dire que, euh, alors, avant de mentionner cette jurisprudence, juste un rappel, je dirais qu'on ratifie la Convention du droit pour préserver l'avenir et pour garantir l'avenir. Et je vais vous expliquer pourquoi. Simplement parce que euh, on pourrait, et certains, certains le soutiennent, à mon sens, à tort, que la Convention UNESCO 70 suffit. Voilà. Et notamment l'article 13 de la Convention qui dit que les États partis à la Convention s'engagent à, le petit c, à admettre une action de revendication de biens culturels perdus ou volés par le propriétaire légitime ou en son nom. Cette disposition a été activée par le Nigeria dans les années, fin des années 90 et, et sur des biens culturels, notamment des biens archéologiques, des statuettes NOC. Or, les statuettes NOC ne peuvent provenir que du Nigeria, donc on ne se posait pas de questions sur euh, éventuellement la diffusion d'air culturel euh, sur plusieurs pays. Donc, la civilisation NOC n'est qu'au Nigeria, et donc des objets archéologiques insignes, donc euh, découverts illicitement, donc issus de pillages au Nigeria, et puis euh, donc, par le, le jeu hein, de, de, du trafic illicite et par le jeu des acquisitions successives pour blanchir l'objet, se retrouve dans la vitrine d'un antiquaire bien connu du 5e arrondissement parisien. Le Nigeria revendique auprès de cet antiquaire donc, ces objets-là en fondant sa requête sur l'article 13 petit c de la Convention 70 que je viens de rappeler. L'affaire arrive devant la Cour d'appel de Paris en 2004, et la Cour d'appel de Paris dit une chose très simple, elle dit que la Convention ne traite que des relations entre États et ne permet pas de régler des litiges entre un État et le ressortissant d'un autre État. Ce qui veut dire que la Convention UNESCO 70, à l'époque, n'avait pas été intégrée, toujours pas dans le droit français, ou au moins très marginalement, enfin très peu aujourd'hui, cette question-là a été tranchée au bénéfice de l'antiquaire, ce qui veut dire que le Nigeria a perdu son conflit euh, de, devant la justice et donc euh, n'a pas pu récupérer les statuettes NOC. Et la solution de la Cour d'appel de Paris de 2004 a été confirmée par la Cour de cassation en 2006. 
Donc, imaginons, je reviens sur la restitution des biens culturels pris par la période coloniale. Ces biens culturels donc, vont intégrer les collections publiques de musées africains. Nous savons tous que dans les musées, et là, ce n'est pas... Ce que je vais dire n'est pas une manière de mettre l'accent sur des musées africains, mais c'est sur la question effectivement du vol, où que ce soit dans le monde, il y, a, il y aura et il y, a, il, y a, il y a aujourd'hui des vols dans des musées dans le monde. Imaginons qu'un objet restitué par la France, hein, prenons ce cas-là, soit quelques années plus tard volé et qu'on le retrouve dans la vitrine d'un antiquaire parisien du 5e arrondissement, eh bien, on aura la même solution que celle du conflit entre l'antiquaire et le Nigeria en 2004. Ça veut dire qu'on aura restitué un objet des collections publiques qui aura intégré les collections publiques d'un autre, autre État africain et qui sera perdu. Donc, voilà pourquoi il faut ratifier la Convention Unidroit de 1995. C'est pour garantir les restitutions qui sont opérées Aujourd'hui, il ne faut pas injurier l'avenir en, en ne ratifiant pas la Convention Unidroit de 1995. Et ouais, si je peux, une, une dernière phrase sur cette question-là, je dirais que euh, je ne, personnellement, je ne comprends pas aujourd'hui que l'on puisse engager un processus de restitution, quel que soit l'État qui l'engage, sans parallèlement engager la ratification de la Convention Unidroit de 1995. C'est la seule solution pour garantir une pleine et effective restitution des biens culturels et pour engager un nouveau dialogue entre les États européens et les États africains. Merci Vincent, très convaincant. <rire> Vraiment. Et, uh, I think we, we have some more uh, uh, questions, Marina. Yes, there is one question. Um, which is the following. Regarding interstate cultural property disputes, would you find the Union Law Convention more suitable than the 1970 UNESCO, having in mind that the states are often reluctant to sue other states at court and sometimes more willing to negotiate through diplomatic channels, such as those suggested within UNESCO 1970? Yeah, I can I can provide a very quick answer because already Vincent Negri uh, explained the reasons why UNIDRA is convenient. Uh, UNIDRA is also a uniform law convention which uh, fills the gaps of the 1970 UNESCO convention, which I remember has been declared not directly applicable by some uh, uh, supreme jurisdictions like the, the Italian and the French Court of Cassations. Uh, this also means the strength of the UNIDRA Convention. And I would add that it's never a, quite never a matter of uh, suing other states at court, because normally the defendant is never a state, is, uh, is uh, somebody pr private, uh, I wouldn't say collector, because I, I, I wouldn't want to criminalize the category of, co of collectors, but it's anyone, uh, is somebody who's, who purchased um, questionable in good faith uh, uh, cultural objects. So you'll never have a state sued before court. So I don't think this is a main uh, issue that raised. The problem is that UNIDRA, uh, probably for political reasons, as has been mentioned before, uh, has found some reluctancy in, in uh, all along the years, but it's getting better anyway. Thank you. If I may, I would just also add that um, the UNIDRA Convention is not only about court, suing in court. There are other ways. And uh, the question was mentioning diplomatic channels. Uh, diplomatic channels are a way for states in particular to negotiate restitution. And uh, it's one of the uh, compulsory declaration that states must Uh, make at the time of ratification. We may talk about this in my presentation tomorrow. So, and many states have chosen the diplomatic uh, channels to do so. The only thing uh, is that even doing this through diplomatic channel, they would have at their disposal uniform, specific and clear mechanisms to do that. So it's not a way of putting court against 
out of uh, judiciary and we'll have this afternoon a, present a specific presentation on this. Thank you. We have more questions, I think. One more or two more. The one from Australia. We have a question uh, for uh, Professor Jakubowski and uh, uh, Mr. Negri. If they could please explain how great anguish Indigenous peoples often see, often still feel at the removal of their human remains without consent fit with the notions of art, created works, ownership and restitution in Unidraw. Okay, okay, so, so, so the issue, that, so the issue is, uh, of human remains, uh, obviously, obviously, obviously here it was, was not, uh, it's, a, it's, a diff, uh, it's, a, it's a different issue and also, also covered by, by, by different laws. So here, here what um, in the discussion, the presentation I gave, there was the issue of object used and created within the community, not the, not the issue of human remains, so it's a different, different, different issue. Vincent? Le, le premier point, la question de vocabulaire. Euh, elle ne se trompe pas, non, je n'ai absolument pas prononcé le mot de rapatriation. Je dirais que c'est tout à fait exact. En fait, les, les, les termes qui apparaissaient dans, le, dans ce nuage de mots, c'était, ce sont des termes de qualification d'effets dommageables qui ont provoqué la perte et la dispersion du patrimoine. Et en droit international, on va d'abord chercher à qualifier l'action. Donc c'est pour ça qu'apparaissaient les termes de pillage, spoliation, butin, trophée, donc tout le vocabulaire qui exprime finalement une prise de possession par un tiers, parfois par la violence, donc de biens culturels. Après, sur le, la, la, la question effectivement du mouvement, du retour en quelque sorte, effectivement, on peut, on peut, on, on peut mobiliser un autre nuage de vocabulaire, je dirais, qui, donc bien évidemment, donc on parle de retour et de restitution davantage pour des biens culturels, de rapatriation pour des restes humains, mais on voit aujourd'hui apparaître le mot de réappropriation, hein, qui est de plus en vogue, de plus en plus en vogue. On peut aussi parler de reconstitution de, de, de collection. Donc il y, a, il y a effectivement des vocabulaires qui indiquent le, comment est-ce que l'on renoue les fils, effectivement, de ce qui a été défait. Or, moi, ce que j'ai présenté dans le, dans le nuage de mots, c'était uniquement la manière dont les fils ont été, ont été défaits. Parce que, encore une fois, ce sont, sont ces actions de, de, de perte hein, du patrimoine qui vont permettre, de, à travers une qualification juridique, d'engager de, un régime éventuellement de responsabilité internationale pour permettre, justement, la restitution, le retour ou la rapatriation. Merci. Marina, we have more. Yes, there is a question for Patty Gerstenbleth, if she's still with us, um, from the permanent delegation of the uh, Syrian Arab Republic. The question is the following. What is the input um, of the, uh, how the UNIDRA Convention uh, can help uh, for uh, concerning cultural objects which are illegally excavated from archaeological sites and therefore non inventoried by definition. Uh, how the UNIDRA Convention can help for such objects the implementation of the uh, Security Council Resolution 2199 and 2347. Thank you for the question. I'm wondering if um, Valentina could turn my video on because I can't um, turn it on myself. It's been turned off um, from, I think, from Unidra. Uh, so I think that what could have happened is that the principle, obviously, the Unidra Convention applies only when both the market state and the country of origin have ratified it. But I do think that. Here we go. Okay, thank you. I do think that we could um, have said in those resolutions that specifically 2199 should have said in recognition of the ownership rights of the state of Iraq and the state of Syria, uh, trade in these artifacts is prohibited. 
So uh, these national ownership laws, the vesting laws have been in effect for a long time. Uh, Iraq since the 1930s and Syria since the 1960s. And this should have, would have provided legitimacy and recognition to the concept of state ownership. In 2347, similarly, where there's a very long laundry list of things that <coughs> could have done, been done, should, have, should be done, it would call for working with the court systems of uh, market states to recognize foreign vesting laws and of course to work with the countries of origin, uh, those that do not have effective ownership laws in place, whether looking at the model provisions or for example, uh, examples of legislation that have been what we call litigated in the courts in market states to see what are the best forms that these uh, vesting laws can take. Um, because again, as, as this has been said, that by viewing these as stolen property, it, uh, regardless of whether a country has ratified the UNIDWA Convention, it means that um, it uh, would automatically bring to bear gener generic law that deals with stolen property. Um, if I may, I want to just add one other comment on this issue of non-retroactivity, which is a very important one for indigenous culture, for cultures that were colonized uh, throughout the 19th century. Um, whether a convention such as the Unidwa Convention is retroactive or not, obviously it's not, um, it still is often a matter of voluntary efforts that are taken. Uh, there was just a note posted in the chat a few minutes ago by uh, Finland uh, recognizing the restitution to Native American tribes in the United States of remains and, and cultural artifacts. And recently in the United States, for example, Congress removed all statute of limitations on the recovery of artworks looted during the Holocaust. So the point is, whether it's done internationally or probably more effectively at the domestic level, when there is a will, when there is sufficient public pressure, uh, and again, we see the legislation pending in, in France as well. So when that pressure is there, when the public opinion is there, when the will is there, these obstacles to the law, such as non-retroactivity or statutes of limitations, these can be eliminated. Uh, and this is, I think, the direction in which we need to move. Thank you. Thank you, Patsy. Uh, I think that, that this session in the morning has been really very successful because this is witnessed by the number of uh, and importance of the questions that have been raised. Uh, but unfortunately, we still have some more questions but unfortunately, uh, we don't have more time. So uh, um, I'm sorry to say that we must stop here for the moment. Uh, we will get back to the, and we'll provide the answers to the questions that have been raised uh, uh, in the afternoon, if possible. Uh, just in case we don't have enough time, uh, the, the, the questions will be, will obtain the uh, written answer in, in the afterwards. So uh, let's say that I, I would like to thank you everybody, all the speakers and all the attendants for this very, very stimulating meeting. Uh, the, um, the, the, this session is closed and we will get back in, at 2.30 Roman time. Thank you to everybody.